Now turn to section 3 on page 33. Test 1, section 3. In this section, you will hear a discussion between two students, Rosie and Mike, and a university tutor. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about a survey they have conducted on local entertainment. First, look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 26. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think we can start straight away by getting Rosie and Mike to do their presentation. Would you like to start, Rosie? Yes. Well, um, we've done a survey on local entertainment. Basically, we tried to find out how students feel about the entertainment in the town and how much they use it. Yes. So, we've called our project Out and About. Yes, that's a good title, Out and About. We wanted to find out how well students use the entertainment facilities in town, whether they get to see the latest plays, films, that kind of thing. Now, we have our own facilities on campus, of course. Oh, yes. We deliberately omitted those, as we really wanted to examine outside entertainment in the town, as opposed to on the university campus. Actually, there were a lot of areas to choose from, but in the end, we limited ourselves to looking at three general categories. Cinema, theatre and music. Right. OK. Well, uh, first of all, cinema. In the town, there are three main places where you can see films. There's the new multi-screen cinema complex, the old park cinema and a late-night Odeon. So, if you look at this chart, in terms of audience size, the multi-screen complex accounts for 75% of all cinema seats. The park cinema accounts for 20% of seats, and the late-night Odeon has just 5% of seats. As you probably know, the complex and the park show all the latest films, while the late-night cinema tends to show cult films. So, when we interviewed the students, we thought the complex would be the most popular choice of cinema, but surprisingly, it was the late-night Odeon. Yeah, and most students said that if they wanted to see a new film, they waited for it to show at the park, because the complex is more expensive and further out of town, so you have to pay more to get there as well. Yes, and that adds to the cost, of course, and detracts from the popularity, evidently. Well, next, we looked at theatres. The results here were interesting because... As you know, there's a, a theatre on campus, which is popular, but there's also the stage theatre in town, which is very old and architecturally quite beautiful. And there's the large modern theatre, the Ashtop, that has recently been built. So you just looked at the two theatres in town? Yes, but the thing about the theatres is that there's a whole variety of seat prices. Also, the types of performance vary. So, students tend to buy seats at both and like using both for different reasons. And if they want cheap seats at the ash top, they can just sit further from the front. What we did find that was very interesting is that there are periods during the year when students seem to go to the theatre and periods when they go to the cinema. And we really think that's to do with budget. If you look at this graph, you can see that... Um, there's a peak around November, December when they go to the theatre more and then a period in April, May when neither is particularly popular and then uh, theatre viewing seems to trail off virtually while the cinema becomes quite popular in June, July. Hmm, I think you're probably right about your conclusions. In the second part of the discussion, Rosie and Mike talk about different music clubs. Look at questions 27 to 30 first. As you listen to the discussion, complete the chart about the different music clubs. Some answers have been done for you. Listen carefully and answer questions 27 to 30. 
Well, lastly, we looked at music, and this time we were really investigating the sort of small music clubs that offer things like folk or specialise in local bands. So not musicals as such? That's right. We looked at three small music venues and we examined the quality of the entertainment and the venue and gave a ranking for these. A cross, meaning that the quality was poor, a tick, meaning it was OK, and two ticks for excellent. First of all, the Blues Club, which obviously specialises in blues music. This was a pretty small place and the seating was minimal, so we didn't give that a very good rating. No, we don't recommend that one, really. Then the Sansu, which plays a lot of South American music. It was a big place, very lively, good performers, so two ticks for that one. The Pier Hotel is a folk venue, a good place for local and up-and-coming folk artists to play. Not the best of venues, as it's in a basement and a bit dark, but the quality of the entertainment was reasonable and the lighting was very warm, so we felt it deserved an average rating. Now, finally, there's the Bald Rock Cafe, which features big rock bands and is pretty popular with students, and we enjoyed ourselves there as well, so top marks for that one. And then, did you get any information from the students as to which of the clubs they preferred? That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 on page 35. Test 1, section 4. You will hear a lecturer talking about dust storms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. In the last lecture, we looked at the adverse effects of desert dust on global climate. Today, we're going to examine more closely what causes dust storms and what other effects they can have. As you know, dust storms have always been a feature of desert climates, but what we want to focus on today is the extent to which human activity is causing them. And it's this trend that I want to look at, because it has wide-ranging implications. So, what are these human activities? Well, there are two main types that affect the wind erosion process, and thus the frequency of dust storms. There are activities that break up naturally wind-resistant surfaces, such as off-road vehicle use and construction. And there are those that remove protective vegetation cover from soils, for example, mainly farming and drainage. In many cases, the two effects occur simultaneously, which adds to the problem. Let's look at some real examples and see what I'm talking about. Perhaps the best known example of agricultural impact on desert dust is the creation of the USA's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The dramatic rise in the number of dust storms during the latter part of that decade was the result of farmers mismanaging their land. In fact, choking dust storms became so commonplace that the decade became known as the Dirty Thirties. Researchers observed a similar but more prolonged increase in dustiness in West Africa between the 1960s and the 1980s, when the frequency of the storms rose to 80 a year, and the dust was so thick that visibility was reduced to a thousand meters. This was a hazard to pilots and road users. In places like Arizona, the most dangerous dust clouds are those generated by dry thunderstorms. Here, this type of storm is so common that the problem inspired officials to develop an alert system to warn people of oncoming thunderstorms. When this dust is deposited, it causes all sorts of problems for machine operators. It can penetrate the smallest nooks and crannies and play havoc with the way things operate because most of the dust is made up of quartz, which is very hard. Another example. The concentration of dust originating from the Sahara has risen steadily since the mid-1960s. 
This increase in wind erosion has coincided with a prolonged drought, which has gripped the Sahara's southern fringe. Drought is commonly associated with an increase in dust raising activity, but it's actually caused by low rainfall, which results in vegetation dying off. In the second part, the speaker talks about the drying up of the Aral Sea. Look at questions 37 to 40 and complete the flowchart. One of the foremost examples of modern human-induced environmental degradation is the drying up of the Aral Sea in Central Asia. Its ecological demise dates from the 1950s, when intensive irrigation began in the then Central Asian republics of the USSR. This produced a dramatic decline in the volume of water entering the sea from its two major tributaries. In 1960, the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world, but since that time it has lost two-thirds of its volume. Its surface area has halved, and its water level has dropped by more than 216 metres. A knock-on effect of this ecological disaster has been the release of significant new sources of wind-blown material as the water level has dropped. And the problems don't stop there. The salinity of the lake has increased so that it is now virtually the same as seawater. This means that the material that is blown from the dry bed of the Aral Sea is highly saline. Scientists believe it is adversely affecting crops around the sea because salts are toxic to plants. This shows that dust storms have numerous consequences beyond their effects on climate, both for the workings of environmental systems and for people living in dry lands. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.